Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. You are preparing to hear a message from Elkhorn Baptist Church. And if today's message and ministry blesses you in any way, and you would like to be a part of our ministry, we ask you to give via our website, www.elkhornbc.org. Now, prepare your hearts for a message from the Lord. Thank you for being here. God bless you. If you're a guest here today, this is what you see every Sunday. We believe the Bible. We, ple we preach the Bible. We believe all of it. We leave nothing out. So we're not going to change today. We're just going to remain the same and preach the Word today, if that's all right with you guys. Friday morning, around 9 a.m., Jesus Christ was taken to a cross. He was beaten, spit upon. The great theologian, Josephus, he said these words. Approximately 600 people walked by Jesus and sped upon him that day. And that was the worst thing in the Jewish customs that you could do is spit on somebody. And they walked around and they, they sped upon Jesus Christ. According to history, the Saturday was called a day of silence. But Sunday, we celebrate as Christians the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe on the third day, the rock was rolled away. We believe that Jesus stepped out in the history, and heaven started singing a song called He's Alive. We believe as Christians today that our God is alive. He is not dead. We believe that the same God of yesterday is the same God that we serve of today. How many of y'all agree with that, that God is alive? He is alive. I am so thankful. That the Jews couldn't kill him, the Romans couldn't stop him, hallelujah, and the grave couldn't hold him. Because that's my Jesus, amen? I'm so thankful that my God's alive. Today, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I'm going to read a familiar scripture, but I promise you I will pull some things from these verses that probably some of you have never heard before. Today's title of this sermon is called, From the Womb to the Tomb. To the bridegroom. From the womb to the tomb to the bridegroom. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to be reading from the King James. So hang with me. It says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. Everybody say early that morning. Early. Yeah. When it was yet still dark. That's why they have sunrise services. Into the grave, into the tomb. And seeth the stone taken away from the tomb, the grave. Then she runneth to her, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That was John the Baptist, because Jesus called John my beloved. This was John and Peter. And said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we know not where they have laid him, where they have taken him. Verse 3, Peter therefore went forth with the other disciple, and they came to the tomb, they came to the grave. So they ran both together. Listen to this, this is a funny verse. And the other disciple did outrun Peter, and they came to the grave, the tomb. And he stooping down, everybody say he stooped down. Yeah. And then he looked in and saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, rambunctious Peter, following him, and went into the grave, went into the tomb, and seeth the linen clothes lying there. Verse 7, and the napkin. Everybody say, and the napkin. Yeah. It was there, it was about his head, not lined with the clothes, not lined with the linen clothes, but wrapped. Everybody say, wrapped. Yeah. It was by and by itself. It was by itself. Then went in also the other disciple. Peter went in first, which came first to the, to the tomb. And he saw and he believed. Father God, in Jesus' name, I pray that, Lord, you work in this service like you've never worked before. God, I know there's probably some lost people here today. I know there's people here today, Lord, that needs a word straight from heaven. I pray today, God, you would set my coattails on fire. The Holy Spirit would run in me and through me and around me, God. And you'll give me a word straight from the throne room of God. Help me preach, the Lord, like this is my last sermon. Help me preach, to God, to those like this was our last day. I love you, Lord, and I thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Turn your neighbor and give him a high five and say, it's good to see you today. Say, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Amen. The first point I want to give you is called from the womb. Everybody say, from the womb. Psalms chapter 51, verse 5, listen to these words. It says, surely, surely I was sinful at birth. I was sinful at birth. It says, sinful from the time my mother birthed me. From the time I came out my mama's womb. Guess what? I was, I was birthed into sin. I was brought into a sinful situation. How many of you know you don't have to train a kid how to, how to sin? You don't have to teach a baby how to sin. That's, that comes natural. That comes natural. You tell them, don't put your hand in that cookie jar. Guess what they're going to do when you turn your head? Half a second later, they're going to put their hand in a cookie jar. Destiny, you too. They're going to put their hand in a cookie jar, and all of a sudden they're going to come to you with, with cookie stuff all over their, their, their face. You're going to say, have you been in that cookie jar? Uh-uh. Lie. Lie. How many of you know you get to be an adult, and then you just really don't care if you get a cookie or not? You know? So you don't have to teach a kid how to sin. Sin comes natural. And even when you get saved, <laughs> sin will come at you. It will come at you. The psalmist said, when I was birthed into sin, I was birthed into a sin-filled, nasty world. John chapter 3, verse 5, 3 through 5. I love this story. It's about Nicodemus. And Nicodemus had a question he wanted to ask Jesus. And listen to this. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot and he will not see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born again when he's old? How in the world can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter the second time? Listen to this crazy stuff. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Can he do that and be born again? And Jesus answered, I love it, verily, verily, I say unto you again. I say unto you again, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, the water and of the Spirit, the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So my second point I want to give you guys is you go from the womb, you go from the, come out of a sinful situation into a sinful world, but here's what I want to show you guys. And I want you all to listen to me this morning. Say, I listen, I'm listening, preacher. There must come a time. There must come a time in your life that you go to the tomb. There's got to come a time in your life that you die. I'm not talking about a physical death, but really I am. But I'm talking about when you die to the flesh, you will rise in the spirit. There comes a time in your life Outside of Easter, outside of Christmas, outside of a Monday, there comes a time that you've got to go to the tomb. There comes a time you've got to die. John chapter 3, verse 5, it says, water represents uh, uh, repentance. Now, I know you, we don't hear about repentance much longer anymore in churches. We don't hear about uh, repentance. But I'm telling you today, what the church needs today is some good old-fashioned preaching, some good old-fashioned repentance, some good old tears coming down your cheek one more time that you're sorry for what you have done. You are convicted by the Holy Ghost. Not that you got busted Friday night or what you did Saturday night. I'm talking about when you're in the unction of God, He'll convict you and you'll, give, you'll have repentance in your life. You'll have some repentance in your life. You don't care who's sitting beside you. You'll run to the altar. You'll run to the tomb. You'll do whatever it takes to make it right between you and the Lord. No matter what people are saying about you. No matter what you did last year in your life. Because I hear this good old, good old lie, especially here in Camelsville. I'm all right. I've been baptized. I'm all right, man. I go to church every once in a while. Can I, can I break that lie up for you really quick? The devil goes to church. Can I break this lie up to y'all really quick? The devil knows scripture. Can I break this lie up to you really, really, really quick? That man, the devil knows more scripture than probably all of us put it together in this house today. 
The one thing Satan did not do was run to a tomb and repent of his sins and say, God, save my soul. Do you know, according to Matthew chapter 25, that hell was not created for me and you? Hell was created for Satan and his demons. The only person that will send you to hell is you. That's the truth. I know this is some tough preaching. And I know we got a lot of guests in the house, but we're not changing. We're going to preach the word of God. Right now, we need people that will run to the tomb and say, God, I'm sorry for what I have done. I am sorry, God, for where I have been. I am sorry, God, for the way I talk about people. I am sorry, God. I repent of my sins. You don't hear about repentance no more, Mitchell. You've got preachers that will get on television, and they don't have to even be on television. And they'll say, oh, just God loves you. And live the way you want to live. And act the way you want to act. Watch this. I would hate to be that person when I take my last breath. I would hate the chance that I think I know God. So today, I really feel that God wanted me to preach a sermon. Just to me and just to you. That you come from the womb to the tomb. I didn't say you are going to confess that you got caught. I'm talking about a dying moment. I'm talking about a day that you go inside that tomb. And you walk in that tomb and you say, God, I am a mess. I didn't say nothing about coming to church, did I? Because here's what I know. When you get born again, hallelujah, and you get saved, and you're under the unction of God, you'll want to be in church. You'll want to be with his people. You will give above and beyond. You'll get filled with the Holy Ghost. And God will make you do things you normally don't do. Somebody praise him in this house. Woo! Thank you, Lord. There's got to be a dying moment. There's got to be a tombstone moment. There's got to be a moment you get over you. There's got to be a moment that that your heart is broken. I remember one time we sold our house. And... uh, I should, man, I just, God tells me to do stuff. I, I don't want to. And there's a little piece of paper that you got to fill out saying that your house, everything was good with it. And I remember I lied on one of those little lines, those little questions that uh, they asked me. And boy, you know, I couldn't go to sleep. And I remember at this church in 2002, I was going up Highway 70, and the Lord got a hold of me. And I know this may not mean nothing to you, but I'm telling you, my God still convicts. My God still works. My God still talks. My God still wants a relationship with you. My God is real. Hallelujah. And I was driving up Highway 7. Here's what the Lord told me. He said, you go to that woman and you tell her you lied and you pay to get it fixed. Now, I didn't like that. I didn't want to do that. The house was done sold. And I showed up at that house, and here's how God just goes before his people. I showed up at that house, and here's what she said. I was wondering when you was going to come back. She said, you're a preacher, aren't you? She had to throw the preacher word up, you know what I'm saying? That's all right. But here's what I'm trying to get people to see. Preacher or not, there's still a Holy Ghost. Preacher or not, God still convicts. God still wants a relationship with you. So what I'm saying, you can't sin comfortable if you're a Christian. You've got to have a tombstone in your life. You've got to have a dying place in your life. You've got to have a place, Jerry Campbell, that you can go back to the altar and say, God, I repent of my sins. If you're sinning comfortably, you better watch out. If you're sinning comfortably and there's no conviction of the Holy Ghost in your life, I'm telling you, your heart has become hard or you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's the truth. Got to be a dying moment. From the womb to the tomb, there has, there has to come a time you go inside the tomb. I just wonder if John and Peter, who walked up to the tomb, just sat there and said, Well, there's where Jesus is at. But they never went and found him, they never went looking for him. God says these words, Thank you, Holy Ghost. He says, You find me while, while I can be found. You dwell in my house and in my presence while you can find me. Hallelujah. 
I'm telling you what the churches need today is some good old repentance, hallelujah. Some good old getting back on their knees. Good old praying and preaching back in the house. We need a Holy Ghost Spirit-filled moment back in God's house. Amen? Somebody say amen. That's what we need. We don't need to back off. I know people laugh and say, y'all believe in a tomb? Y'all believe what, that Jesus died? You believe he got back out? Yeah. And I ain't backing off of it. I don't care if the ACLU shows up. I don't care if I got to preach like Paul and Silas did in jail. They got visitation every Saturday. Y'all come see me. I'm just telling you the truth today. There's got to come a time when you feel that Holy Ghost. When you know when you met. I'm talking even if you say something to your wife. Even say something to your, your husband. Even if you say something to these kids that you know is not right. I pray the unction of Holy Ghost. It'll jump on you. And you'll sit there and go, ooh, I shouldn't have said that. You know what that means? You still feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. Can't even sin comfortable no more. Can't even go places I used to go. Flesh rises up and say, ooh, go there, go there. My spirit says, don't go there, boy. Don't you talk like that. Because you know why? I've got a tomb. And I got a place I die daily. I got a place I call the altar. I got a place where I get altered. I got a place where I go to and find the presence of God. And what I'm trying to tell the churches today is that you come from the womb to the tomb. And the next step is to the bridegroom. From the womb to the tomb to the bridegroom. I hear preachers preach this all the time that the tomb was empty. How many of y'all have heard that? The tomb was empty. Well, according to Scripture, it wasn't empty. Now, before y'all jump up and start throwing bananas at me. Now, there wasn't a body there. Jesus' body wasn't in the tomb. Now, listen to me. There were two things that were in that tomb. Now, I want y'all to write this down. You probably not ever, never heard this. If you have, praise God, help me preach. Two things were in the tomb early that morning. Number one, there was grave, the grave clothes of Jesus. The grave clothes of Jesus. Y'all remember Lazarus in Luke chapter 11? <laughs> Lazarus came out of the tomb with his grave clothes on. You remember that? Check this out. You know why? Because Lazarus knew he was going to, have to die again. He knew he was going to, have to die again. But how many of you know when Jesus walked out of the tomb, his linen clothes he left behind because he said, I don't need them no more. Where I'm going, I don't need them no more. And God said these words, keep your clothes, keep your grave clothes, keep his stuff because I am God. He didn't need no grave clothes because he didn't have to die no more. You know, you can put Muhammad and Buddha. You can put all, whoever you want to in an old grave. They're going to stay. Even a lost person will tell you yeah, I, 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 there's something about that story. There's something about Jesus. Do you realize how blessed you are under my teaching today? To have a God in you that is big, and you're born again, and you're saved, and one day you're not going to need no grave clothes. You're not going to need no grave clothes. Because where we're going, hallelujah, we are a spirit, and we shall worship him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. The second thing that they found in that, in that grave, in that tomb, was a napkin. It was a napkin. It was a folded napkin. It was neat and nice. But the Bible says, according to John chapter 20, this napkin was off by itself. It wasn't with the linen clothes. It was all by itself. In other words, when they walked in that tomb, Jesus wasn't there. There was clothes laying there, but there was a folded napkin. There was a folded napkin. That's what the Bible says. Now listen to this. According to... To Jewish history and even still to the day, when Jews go to a restaurant and they go to that restaurant and they eat their meal, if they, if they don't like the meal, they wind up their napkin and they place it on the table. And what that means is, oh, you wasted my time. <laughs> this food stunk. I'll never be back. But if a Jew was at a restaurant or at somebody's home and you seen that Jew take that napkin and start folding it, Neat and nice, neat and nice. And they take that napkin and they put it off to the side. What that means is this, this word, listen to me. What it means, I've enjoyed your fellowship and I will be back. I will be back. 
I will be back. I will be back. So what Jesus was saying when Peter and John went into that tomb, they seen his clothes. Hey, I enjoyed the time with you, but hey, watch out. Don't forget the napkin. I'm coming back. How many of you know, hallelujah, that we're living in the third day? How many of you know we're living in the, the last days of the Lord? Hallelujah. We're living in the last days of God. The folded napkin. Now, now watch this. Now watch this. The only prophecy, and I've heard this, this lie before, every prophecy has been fulfilled. No, it hasn't. Listen to this preacher. No, it hasn't. The only prophecy that has not been fulfilled is the folded napkin. Is the folded napkin. So what that means, at any God-given moment, God can look over at Jesus. And he says, unfold the napkin. I'm going back to get my church. I'm going back to get my children. I will be back. Hallelujah. Somebody give him praise. That we got a God that's coming back. He's not forgot you. He's on time every time. Hallelujah. We're living in the last days. The folded napkin generation. That's when I look at you guys look at me. We're the folded napkin generation. I just wonder today if the napkin... Were to be unfolded, where would you be? You say, Brian, I'm good. I, I disagree with everybody from the front all the way to the back. Everybody under my teaching today could be closer to Jesus Christ. Oh, let me tell you another good, a good thing that you can write down in your notes. Peter and John ran to the tomb. Y'all remember that? Say, I got you, preacher. They ran to the tomb. Notice what it says they stooped down. They stooped down. They stooped down. What that is in Jewish custom, the door was always smaller than the Jew. So what that means is this. Before you get into the presence of God, you've got to humble yourself and bow down and come to a position in your life that you're down on your knees and say, God, wherever you're at, I'm coming to you. I'm going to get to you. I've humbled myself. You don't see people on their knees no more. You don't see people humbling themselves no more. You know why we live in a generation? A blessed generation. Got your Sunday best on. But I'm telling you, if Jesus Christ would have shown up today, he would have walked in in a big old gown. A big old robe. It would have been dirty. It would have been nasty. What I'm trying to tell you is this. Everybody here today come from a womb. You've got sin in your life. Everybody under my teaching today, you see that tomb? That's where we need to go right there. We need to go in that tomb, and to get in that tomb, you've got to humble yourself. You can't let pride rise up in you. You can't let emotion rise up in you. You've got to bow down. You've got to humble yourself to get into the presence of God. You can't walk into a tomb and go, well, I was right, daggone, where's he at? You can't walk into a, a tomb or a situation with pride in your life. That's why you got to bow down and humble yourself. And I guarantee you, as many people as we have here today, there's some people that need to bow down to get to their tomb. You need to bow down to get into your tomb. Your next step is the folded napkin, the bridegroom. Do you realize that's all we like? People tell time, boy, y'all, y'all fired up out there at Elkhorn, aren't you? Yeah, boy, yes, we are. <laughs> yes, we are. Because we're living in the folded napkin days. Boy, y'all, y'all like to give them altar calls. Y'all give two or three altar calls to every day on service, don't you? <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. We're a get her, get her done church. We're a get her done. We're, we're a folded napkin generation. We believe in any God-given moment, the horn could sound. And if the horn sounds, guess what? If you're in Christ and you have went to the tomb, you're with the bridegroom. Hallelujah. You're with God. Hallelujah. You can't come back. It's over. It is finished. Hallelujah. 